Susan, I'm gonna start with you. I, we've, we've read the book, we have a stack of polls here. I hope we get to all of them. But, but tell me what for you is the thing that, that you walk around and, and you're like, I can't believe we were able to report this on the record. Well, Nicole, I have to say, I'm a little upset with Liz Cheney because that orange Jesus quote would have been really great to include in the book. Uh, certainly a chapter title, it would have warranted, uh, if not uh, changing the book title altogether. But uh, look, I, I think you just quoted from uh, uh, the resignation letter of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff that he wrote out. Uh, even though we knew in a general sense that there was this conflict, running conflict throughout all four years of the Trump presidency between Trump and the generals who were so alarmed uh, by what he was trying to do to disrupt American national security. For me as a journalist over three decades, I can never remember being more just mind blown the first time uh, that we had access to the full text of that letter and understanding that the sitting leader of the United States military, the nonpartisan U.S. military, uh, believed the president of the United States was doing grave and irreparable damage, that he did not subscribe to many of the principles that the United States fought for in World War II. Uh, you know, this was, this is really, for me, it, it captured this extraordinary moment in American history. And it is the reason why Peter and I decided to devote the time after Trump left office to trying to find out more about what happened during his presidency. Susan, I, I went back and looked at some of your national security coverage while Trump was president. And, and it's, it's what was public facing while he was in office is all building to what, to what you completely blow out in the reporting on the book. And I, I wonder if you can just so, sort of encapsulate for me whether you knew or whether it was known that his own military leaders, cabinet members, saw him as a threat to the, quote, international world order, or whether some of that came out after he turned on the government he ostensibly led on January 6th. Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, had anyone known uh, the extent of that conflict and the fears of uh, the, the U.S.'s national security leadership at the time. Those would have been banner headlines in the New York Times and every other news organization. There was a general sense of, you know, conflict. You would hear reports, uh, people reported them contemporaneously, like when Jim Mattis, the first Trump defense secretary left. Uh, you know, I remember hearing, and it was reported, people saying it's much worse than you can even imagine. But we didn't know chapter and verse on what it was. I wrote a story, Nicole, I remember vividly back in 2017 after Trump's disastrous first NATO meeting in which I wrote a little bit about this from my sources that, you know, Trump uh, was attacking NATO, was refusing to say that he believed in Article 5, the, you know, all for one, one for all common defense principle and had taken it out of his speech. That was big news at the time, but I didn't know uh, and was amazed to hear senior officials tell Peter and I in reporting this book that they believe Trump was much closer than we knew at the time to withdrawing from NATO. Peter, you are one of the best White House reporters, but this was not your first rodeo. You covered the White House in which I served. I think you were still at the Washington Post, or you were at the Washington Post and then, and then the New York Times, and then you covered, obviously, the Obama White House and wrote incredible, compelling, deeply reported books about both those presidencies. This book is so different. It is an indictment of a failed human being. It is a collapse of character. And I wonder if you sort of widen the lens of your own reporting about American presidents, how reporting this book out felt. Well, it is different than other books, but it's different because of the facts set. In other words, the facts that are presented in this book are what would be called damning by anybody because of what he actually did. You know, my view is we took we take the approach to journalism the same. We look at what's in front of us. We try to discover what's not shared with us. We try to present that to our readers. And what we found here, as opposed to other presidencies, is a story we've never seen in American history. We've never seen a president who was so willing to, to, to push the boundaries of the Constitution to, to warp the traditions and, and attack the institutions that have served us for 246 years in, in the same way that he has. So that to understand January 6th, our thesis became you had to understand January 20th, 2017, and every day that came in between because it was an inexorable four-year march to this violent conclusion that was eminently predictable uh, if we had understood exactly what he was doing at the time. We tried to understand at the time, as Susan said, we decided it was worth going back after we left after he left office, try to learn more. And I'm sure there'll be more 
to come. But there's, this is an important moment, I think, to take stock. Peter Baker, you write about, um, you're able to report out a president whose fact set suggests that he didn't want soldiers wounded in service of the country marching in military parades. Um, you report out that Lindsey Graham, his most public defender, called him a mother effer. Um, I mean, it is a, a searing and devastating uh, portrait of the American presidency and the person who occupied it. I, I guess a version of the same question I, I asked Susan, w was the reporting on the book the first time you saw that version of him, that, that Mark Milley feared that the international world order was in danger, that John Kelly advised people not to work there because he was so bad? Yeah, look, we spent four years trying to report out as many of these stories as we could during his presidency. And what we discover, of course, as we always do, is when the presidency is over, or at least when a president leaves office, that people are more willing to talk than they were when he's in office, right? And so people were more uh, willing to tell us and share things that they had not before. We were able to report things out that we didn't know before or expand on things that we did know and understand them better, right? I mean, I think one of the things we were surprised by is learning new details and new complexion stories that we had reported at the time but didn't fully understand, as well as learning things we didn't know at the time. Good example, Greenland. This is a funny small thing, I suppose. But when people heard President Trump talk about buying Greenland, they thought it was kind of like a one-off, you know, thought balloon or whatever. But in fact, this has been going on for years because one of his billionaire friends had been trying to push him toward that. And it forced the whole National Security Council apparatus to try to draft a plan. They even came up with an options memo, including like a lease back provision. You know, they, they, they took this very seriously. We didn't know that at the time. It's one of these things you can learn after an administration leaves office. And, and it, it talks about the importance of doing books like this so we can learn more about what happened, especially because it may happen again. Susan, one of the perfect examples or illustrations of this is the Mueller investigation, which is so brilliantly covered um, by so many news organizations, especially the Times. You learn something new about how Trump wanted to try to deal with that. Um, tell that story. Uh, well, you, you know, he was constantly searching, as you know, and as is detailed in the report, uh, he's constantly searching uh, for people to, you know, rid him of this this meddlesome uh, special counsel. And he's also, as you know, infuriated by his first attorney general, Jeff Sessions, for recusing himself from this. And, uh, you know, that was, I think, one of the more extraordinary dramas of the first couple years of the Trump presidency. And we found out that he actually was repeatedly seeking uh, basically a loyalist, someone who he thought would do his bidding as the attorney general and actually going uh, to not one but two different members of his cabinet at the time, seeking people uh, who would be agreeing to go and replace Jeff Sessions and presumably take over uh, and eliminate uh, the Mueller investigation, obviously, that uh, didn't happen. But what he found in Bill Barr was a loyalist who who actually did do an enormous amount to to distort and shape the public's impression of the Mueller investigation that turned out to be misleading when we actually got to see the report ourselves. And Bill Barr is a great example because he's both an enabler uh, and a facilitator of Donald Trump. But then he says after the election, well, I'm off the train now. As you know, he's written a critical memoir. He's spoken out and said there was no uh, election, widespread election fraud that would warrant overturning the election. Uh, but that's part of why we did the book, too, because um, Bill Barr is also a bit disingenuous, right, Nicole, when yeah. he says, oh, my goodness, he went crazy after the election. But really, this was the Trump all four years. Exactly. Um, I want to read some more. Um, you're, you're both brilliant and beautiful writers. I, I want to read. We talked about Article 5, but this is what's in the book about it. Trump had been briefed early in his tenure about Article 5 and how mutual defense in NATO worked. Quote, you mean if Russia attacked Lithuania, we'd go to war with Russia? He responded. That's crazy. He hinted many times that he wanted out of NATO, a senior defense official recalled. He never said do it, but he got really close. A senior White House official confirmed, quote, he wanted to pull out of NATO on a number of occasions that was actually much more serious than people realized. Peter Baker, I remember on that trip, um, 
the national security team calling back to the states on multiple occasions, and I, I imagine they were they were um, doing far more aggressive and frantic outreach to reporters like yourself. He's going to do it. He's going to do it in the Poland speech. He's going to do it in the next speech. He's going to do it. We wrote it in there. Uh, oh, what happened? He didn't say, oh, it'll be in the next speech. I mean, how, how, I think what the book reveals is we were much, it felt like we were on the edge of a knife and we were actually already being cut by that knife. And article, your Article 5 reporting is an incredible example of that. Well, and imagine how impactful that would be today, right? When Vladimir Putin invades Ukraine, in part because he's trying to drive a wedge in NATO, imagine if NATO had been fractured uh, successfully the way Donald Trump seemed to want to do it. If the United States had pulled out of NATO, what would that mean in terms of uh, Vladimir Putin today? NATO has been reunified, in effect, by Vladimir Putin after having been torn uh, apart during Trump's presidency. So it's, it's not an esoteric question. It's not an abstract question. It's a question with a great deal of geopolitical import right now.